Hello and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 16, hashtag Shelfie. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We're live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Every week, we hope to highlight some of that feedback, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com, that's S-E-A-N. Feel free to comment about our show format or anything you'd like to say. You can also feel free to reach out on social media. Look for Tabletop Bellhop, one word, pretty much everywhere out on the web. On to the comments. Scott M. commented on my blog post about Power Grid. I liked the throwback, both the original review and the updates. I'm a big fan of Power Grid 2, and like you, haven't expanded to the extra boards. Thanks, Scott. Sometimes it's good to stick to the classics. Why fix what isn't broken? Jonathan Wheat writes, Love your podcast. Been binging, listening to episode 10 right now, learning about some cool-sounding games, even if that's not your top 20 today. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. Every time I see that top 20 list come up or someone mentions it or I'm scrolling through the blog, I'm like, man, I'm, I'm so tempted to redo the whole board game ranking engine just to see how much has changed yet. Because like certain games like St. Petersburg, I'm big on. We just played that on Monday. I've been playing that new version like crazy. I'm pretty sure that's going to jump up there. So Ryan Peach, who I interact with on Twitter often, he's come up on the show a couple times. He's my guy that reminds me that not all gamers are as capable as I am. Uh, he turned into our, tuned into our show last time, which was pretty cool. Uh, he did have some comments, though. Your co-host could use, sorry, your co-host could do to get a little closer to his mic, but your audio is solid, and you have a good radio voice. Again with the radio voice thing. Well, thanks for your comment, Ryan. We love negative feedback as much as positive. It helps us improve the show. I've been kicking myself for my audio problems as I work to edit the podcast painfully trying to make sure our levels last. I'll, tr I'll promise I'll try and speak up for your sake as well as mine. <laughs> now, Keith R. Lau on Facebook commented, I wanted to say thank you for mentioning Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. I bought it on your mentioning of it, and my daughter really loved it. That is awesome. I love hearing that, Keith. Uh, it really is a fantastic game. I'm glad your daughter enjoyed it as much as my kids do and most of my fellow gaming group. At Chad E. Robbers on Twitter writes, Got to see your Twitch cast last week. Pretty neat. I like the bell when changing topics. I like my bell. It's my calling card, my trademark. Thanks, Chad. Lastly, we have another five-star Apple Podcast review. Thank you, Steve D. I think you summoned them. <laughs> A great board he just showed up in show. chat. Love the interaction and community-based podcast that Mo and Sean run with the Tabletop Bellhop. I always find these type of podcasts where the hosts are so interactive the best. Catch them stream the live show on Twitch, email in questions, chat via Twitter, etc. These guys are very open to chatting and are always asking for participation. If you're into board gaming, you owe yourself a subscription to listen to the show. One of the few shows I tip via Patreon. Thank you so much, Steve. I, I appreciate much, that. Steve. We, that we is one of the things we want to do diff that's different from every other show, right? We are here for you. We are here for me. The, the, the whole speech I give at the beginning, right? Like the whole goal is to answer your game and game night questions. We want to interact with you. We are here to help you. I want to put my game experience to use for you. That's the whole goal of the show. And I'm glad to see it's being appreciated. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's not just a spiel. It's what we actually believe. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the Bellhop's tabletop? So every week, I like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com. 
So I'm sad to say I did not sit down at a game table today, this week. Sorry, not today. This week, I, I haven't played a single game out of my collection. Not a single box was opened in my house at a game store or at a con. Um, Monday night, there was no way we were playing. Uh, Extra Life, that, that day was sleep day. That was the day of recovery. Um, Friday, call, Cat called and canceled Gloomhaven as she had Extra Life crud, which is it's basically like a mini con, so I guess it's like a small version of con crud. Well, considering the you tore a piece off of your eye, you could be said to have suffered your own con crud in its own That's true. Way. I don't know if that's crud. Definitely con damage. I, I took a crit. I don't know. So then Saturday would have been game night at CG Realm, but they were just open for 32 hours the be- week before. Uh, 32 hours the week before for Extra Life. Uh, plus, it was one of the owners, like his mom's 88th birthday, and like I can't really blame him for going to his mom's 88th birthday instead of hanging around with a bunch of gamers. So basically, Extra Life messed up everything, but it was worth it. Um, if you look at our last episode, we talk or I talk way too much about Extra Life. For more than half the show, uh, we raised a phenomenal amount of money for the kids. It was definitely worth doing. Yeah, and it's also not too early to start thinking about next year if you'd like to take part somehow. I know my calendar is marked so that I can actually be present in Windsor next year to help out our team. But not only is our team available to help, but you can think about starting your own team and taking part Mm -hmm. in your own wave for Extra Life. That would be phenomenal. Yeah, we had a we actually had a wrap up meeting. That was one of the things that happened on the weekend where a lot of ideas came out on how we can do better next year. So all I can say is the group, the key group that helped us out this year isn't going to be happy unless we hit 10,000 next year. So we're already working towards that goal. So no gaming. Well, no, not really. Just no physical gaming. I didn't take any games out, but Board Game Arena was there to save the day. I played a lot of online games through the week. I never really had the whole sit down for two hours and play a game, but I had enough time where I could jump in and check, you know, take a turn on the seven games I'm playing and jump back out. Uh, I know we've been talking about board game arena a lot here, um, but I thought it was worth talking about the games I played in the last week. So I was first introduced to it by Eric Franklin, uh, who I originally met on Google+. Plus, Fantastic gamer who goes under the handle Game Time, spelled um, T-H-Y-M-E, like the spice. Uh, you can find him all over the web. Good friend of mine who I've interacted with only online, never met him in real life. Uh, we played Destiny on Friday nights on the PlayStation 4 network, right? Good guy, hang out with him all the time. He's the one that got me to play Board Game Arena. So at first, we started small, right? Uh, it was mainly Seven Wonders. He's played a lot of games with him and we've been slowly adding games and players like we got sean and angie games into it as well which is pretty cool so what i want to do is take a bit more time to look at the five games i've got going on now and talk about how good they are on board game arena so why what's different between playing the actual game or whether i've been enjoying it or not so up first is seven wonders i already mentioned that this is a fantastic implementation of the card game It started with only four players, and we kept adding people. And basically, we play it so much that every time a game ends, someone hits rematch, and another one starts within five minutes. Like, we just keep playing Seven Wonders over and over. I think I'm up to 55 plays of Seven Wonders now. Like, that's total, counting my physical copy. But it's starting to reach my most played game because of this. Uh, Right now, we are playing six players regularly. In this case, I think I actually prefer board game arena to the physical copy because one of the problems especially in my basement is i have an eight by four table and you sit seven people around that table you can't see what everyone's doing and in seven wonders yes in general you're going to focus on the player on your left and right but really it does matter if that player across the way is collecting that one science card and you know you passed it and you're hoping it gets back around it's nice to know oh look someone built it right so one of the things that's better on board game arena you can look and you can literally see everyone's cards it's all right there in the open the other thing and this is a big advantage of board game arena for all games is you can't cheat and i never cheat intentionally in seven wonders but almost every game when we go to score at the end someone has built a duplicate copy of a card that seems to be the one thing that people make a mistake on you can only own one of every card and someone will build two identical technologies because there's two to three copies of some of those cards so that is something i like plus it does all the math at the end like 
Seven Wonders is a game where I actually use a score book, and it's not quick to add up. It's nice to see the game just go, blah, 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 blah. someone other than me wins. Well, sometimes. <laughs> a lot of the time, it is still you. Most win. of the time. No, uh, I don't know. I, my, my track record on that one. I've got a couple. High. I've got a couple of, uh, in the win column on that one so far. Uh, so it definitely avoids the problem not being able to see what's down that table. Yeah. That's, that's a huge deal because uh, the only time I've played it in person is at your table. And mm. like, especially at New Year's when we played, I think, seven players. I yep. had no idea what Dee and uh, Aaron's husband were doing. Not a clue. Mm. Um, and I still won, but that was just me. Uh, <laughs> the, we the tied. Thing, Two-way tie. That's true. But I had more cash, so I won. That's true. Uh, the other thing I really enjoy about it is, even though the, the turn takes a while, so each game takes a while, because we're just cycling through them, I do, I'm enjoying trying strategies that I might not actually try if I was sitting down at a table. Uh, we're just going to play up again as soon as we're done. So if I learn, not a big deal. So I'm willing to take risks and try other things that I might not have tried otherwise. And uh, it improves my gameplay. Yeah, it's excellent. Overall, actually, uh, Board Game Arena is great for that, right? Like, the games are over fairly quick, and it's a good place to play. Like, play around. So, next up was Takedo. So, actually, I first started playing this to play with Sean. Because I was looking, trying to find something that was fairly simple two-player that I could hopefully teach over chat, which didn't work that great, but overall eh, it was so-so. Um, and I wanted something that I enjoyed playing two players that was on Board Game Arena and was also free to play because neither of us had a premium account at the time. Um, then Eric, who I mentioned earlier, saw we were playing, so he started adding more players. So again, it kind of grew, right? So I think I have three games going on right now, um, one with a full five. Another one with, I think it's just Sean and Enchi Games. And then the last one Sean did was actually where we played the board backwards. That was kind of interesting. It, it's neat. Yeah, it's it's slow, but fun. Yeah. And uh, I have to say, winning a lot helps. I'm, my, uh, <laughs> my gamer score on that one is up. Up until up until you broke out your physical game, copy, yeah, where, that uh, helped. I was doing great. Yeah, so that was mainly with Crossroads, right? So we started playing with just the basic rules, but once we added in Crossroads, I mentioned this last few shows, uh, especially how it's not easy to learn on Board Game Arena. So I went and got my physical copy of Crossroads out and played it a couple times. And I'm like, now that I played the physical copy, I get the Board Game Arena copy better. And since I've done that, I don't think I've lost a game. So <laughs> it has given me a bit of an advantage. But in the this case, though, I think I'd rather play the physical copy. There's just something about it that's just more enjoyable. I, I can see, again, it goes with the zen nature of it. That, that moving of your piece on there definitely helps. Although, I have to say, the scoring, again, I, I love not having to score. It's That's true. Especially, yeah, when, that you is get, especially when you get into the bonus points in some of the crossroads options mm -hmm. where you're scoring two points for some things after a certain point when you get a card. I can definitely see how that would be a pain to score. Um, the one thing with the physical copy, too, there's something about moving your thing on the board. I don't know. It's just it's it's a it's a journey. Right. And actually yeah. collecting the cards even more so, though, it's picking up the card. Like, I don't know, something about looking through the menu cards and putting them on the bottom of the deck and stuff like that. Plus, I, I kind of blinged out mine. So I own the Kickstarter version of Rising Sun. And when I bought that, it came with these amazing metal coins, right? Like Chinese fortune coin style coins, the round ones where you can put a, a string through them. So it also came with the plastic ones because I kickstarted it, right? So I got the retail version of Rising Sun as well as all the bonuses. So I took those plastic coins out and I had them just sitting on a shelf just for something to do. And then we went to play Takaido the other day and I'm like, oh, those coins will be perfect. So I stole the plastic coins from Rising Sun and put them in Takaido. Now, the metal coins would probably be even better, but it's the be holding these physical, like, textured 3D pieces does add something. Hmm. I did see Steve D asked if um, Board Game Arena is free. Sort of. So there are a bunch of games you can play completely free. I think Takedo was one of them. Um, I think Race for the Galaxy, but none of the expansions. Seven Wonders, it might have been one. I'm not sure. So we didn't even realize when we first started. So one of the games I tried to play with Sean was I wanted to play Carcassonne 2-player before trying Takedo, and I could not. 
So what they have is it's about three fifty to four dollars Canadian a month for a premium account, which really is is very reasonable. I'm not sure what it is in U.S. And once one person who's playing at the table has the premium account, you're all good. So as long as the person with the premium account starts the game, they can then invite people who are normal players. So what we were doing is Eric would start the game and invite us. And then I mentioned this the other day. I'm going to forget her name. I think it's Stephanie. Eric's wife was kind enough to gift myself and NG Games with a premium account uh, just for – you know, like I said, we're good friends. We interact online all the time. So I thought that was fantastic. So we do have a premium account now so I can start all the games. Now, because of that, I don't know now what's premium, what's not, because it's not like it tells me. It's just I can just start all the games. So moving on to the next one. Next one is Race for the Galaxy. This one's decent. It's it's not an amazing implementation. It's It's functional. So Steam, I don't know who, but you can get it on Steam. Someone put out a Race for the Galaxy licensed copy you can get on Steam. Somehow I got to playtest that. I'm not sure how I got in on that deal, but I got a free Steam code to check out the game, and I did give some feedback. So I got that free, so I don't know how much it costs. It is fantastic. It's a excellent, perfect digital version of Race for the Galaxy. The Board Game Arena one, this goes back to Sean's original complaint when he first saw Board Game Arena. It's ugly. And the interface is clunky. And there's times things come up and it says at the top, it's like, must consume a world. And you're like, I don't know what to do. What do how do I do this? What do I click on? It's rough. It, it is not. It's, it's probably the ugliest of the games I play on Board Game Arena, but it is functional. What I do dig, though, is it's really good for expansions. So you can totally mix and match. You're like, I want to play with Gathering Storm and I want to play with Alien Artifacts. And out of Alien, or Gathering Storm, I want to use the most and the next or first goals, but I don't want to use drafting or so on. It's, it's really neat. And the one way we've been playing with Eric that's fun is the drafting version, but oh my God, it's long. Because you draft the entire deck of cards. And when you're waiting for other people to play, like unless you're all on at the same time, it takes days. Our first game took us a week and a half before the game started. It was nuts. Um, what I do dig about Race for the Galaxy is is something true of the, the base game as well as the board game Arena 1 is it plays just as well at all player counts. So I'm really enjoying it playing two players. I've been enjoying it playing with Anchi Games and Strangers. I play with a whole bunch of different people there. Now, again, I would much rather play my physical copy. It is ugly. I like holding the cards. I like tossing the cards in a box and sliding them underneath. I Again, it's a nice to have something track the score and also the cheating problem. Race for the Galaxy is another game where you can't buy a card you already own and it's really easy to forget to consume something and when you consume and trade, you may may mess up what you're doing. So it is nice to have that safety net of you can't cheat. One day I'll figure out that game. <laughs> One day. It, it, you don't have to. It, no, it no, doesn't I, hurt not I, knowing I'm it. Determined. I am determined <laughs> that I, at some point, I will figure out Race for the Galaxy. There you go. That, there's an Extra Life 2019 goal. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, Something new that I played on there uh, that I haven't actually talked about at all on the podcast. Uh, that's Dice Forge. So I was doing my tabletop gaming deals thing, tab at tabletop underscore deals on Twitter, where I search for board game deals and share those with the world and hopefully make a few bucks if people click on the links and buy stuff. Doesn't cost the people who click on the links anything, but helps me out. Um, I found this amazing deal on Dice Forge. Like, it was like 65% off. It was crazy. But my budget's not really there yet. Um, support the bellhop at patreon.com, and maybe you can fix that, help fix that. But I don't have really any money for buying games right now. But this was such a good deal that I'm like, man, you know, I think maybe we can justify this one. So I wasn't sure, though, because I don't – like when you have a significant board game budget, it's really easy to go, oh, the game's rated 8 on Board Game Geek. Just buy it. It'll be good. When you don't have a big budget, you have to be more discerning, which is I'm assuming why some of you people listen to us. Um, so I wanted to try this game, and I found that it's on Board Game Arena. And I'm like, sweet, Deanna and I can try this out. Now, the problem is, I guess this one is a paid. You do have to subscribe. Again, thank you, Stephanie and Eric, for gifting us with the subscription, so this wasn't a problem. Now, one of the things I thought really odd about Dice Forge 
is that almost everyone online talking about this game is like, this game's so unique. You take dice and you pop the the facets off and change the dice. And I'm like, well, wait, what about the old Lego games? Or even more so, Rattle Bones from Rio Grande Games. Like, that game's about five, maybe ten years old. We played Rattle Bones at Origins. I dig it. It's it's cool. It's lots. You get three different colored dice. And there's got to be like 30 or some different dice faces you could put on. It's very neat. That The thing with Rattle Bones, though, is it's light. Like the mechanic of Rattle Bones is swapping the dice. Other than that, you're just moving around. It's, it's literally a roll and move. You're going to roll and you're going to move your guy. And where you land, you're going to swap out your dice. And then there's one little bit of set collection. It's, it's pretty much all about improving those dice, right? It's engine building, proving your dice. Now, Dice Forge is way more strategic and I actually found the dice don't matter as much. What really seems to matter is later in the game, you're going to be buying cards. So there's you can improve your dice, but quickly, like I'd say it's probably about the midpoint of the game, you're no longer worried about improving your dice, you're worried about buying cards. So that is a very different feel than Rattle Bones. Overall, it's neat. Um, I dig it. D and I play two players. Um, the first time we screwed up and invited a bunch of strangers and we were fubbling around, that, that was... A bit of a mess, uh, a real bit of a mess. Um, we're still trying to figure some stuff out. It looks good on the uh, onboard game. It looks fantastic. Uh, it's, again, very difficult to learn. So I literally went and found a PDF of the rules to try to figure it out because just clicking things on board game arena was not working. And I actually finally registered for a board game geek membership specifically for, for things like this. Uh, we started up a new game recently that we'll talk about next <laughs> week. And I wanted to find the rules for it. And the best set of rules I found was on Board Game Geek. But mm -hmm. you do need to have a uh, registration membership to download the PDF. Uh, but it's a full copy of the actual, uh, like, photocopy of the game rules. or scan. Game rules, yeah. So it's just the best way to do it. So now I finally, after all our uh, <laughs> chat of it, have a Board Game Geek uh, registration. We're going to start chanting one of us one of us one of us not until i start <laughs> recording my plays then i, then I there you go yeah, he hasn't start, there you go that, that's when you know when you can see his recorded plays so at this point though i didn't actually end up buying dice forge uh by the time we got through the first two games especially the one where we were fumbling around with strangers who were trying to teach us how to play in chat um the sale had ended and while I do the whole tabletop gaming deals thing because of that. I have a real hard time buying any game that's not at least 30% off. So, Yeah, so un unlike tech, board games age well. So another sale will come around and another opportunity will hit. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure it'll come around and maybe I'll pick it up. Maybe it'll be on the Christmas list this year. I don't usually get games for Christmas, but this might be the one year. So the last game, it's just taking longer than I thought to talk about these. Last game for Board Game Arena is Terra Mystica. So that one, I haven't gotten in as many games because it's big. It's a big, heavy, complex game with lots of options. And one of the problems with that one that's really frustrating on Board Game Arena is when you do things, it often triggers other things that other players have to respond to. The most obvious is the power, the way the power bowls work. I don't know, people, the little purple things. When you build a building, if it's next to an opponent's building, that opponent has an option of spending experience points to get power points. So I sit there and it's my turn. I go, oh, I build a settlement. Oh, now I have to wait because I got to see if Eric wants to spend one XP to get two power points. And I wait and I wait and I go do something else. And I check in board game arena two hours later. And I'm like, oh, good. Eric's done. My temple's built or my, my settlement's built. And he got did whatever. I don't even know what he did. All right, good. I'm done my turn. Oh, wait, it has to ask me, do you want to do conversions? Which is something you can always do in the turn. You can convert your resource. You can move your resources around so you can trade in a good resource for a worse resource, which you do often. But again, it comes back and it asks me that. And I'm like, no, I don't want to. So it's not even like when Eric makes his decision, it moves to the next player. No, it still has to come back to me. And then I have to say, no, I don't want to do conversions. Like if there was just a checkbox, it's like not only after he's done doing his power, don't ask me. Now, they did add in one thing that's kind of nice is you can put in a um, – you want to – you're willing to give up X XP. So you can go, I, I, I'm willing to spend up to 2 XP, don't ask me. So that does help, and that's good at the beginning, but – 
at the end of the game, you really want to care. Like you're, you're more worried about that power points in particular and your XP. So it's a little tighter and it takes more time, but like, just building one building, it might be two days by the time that action completes, depending on how often people play. Well, and I've th- been thinking I should grab the rule set for this one and, and learn, and maybe the, the, the three of us can do a, uh, hey, we're all here together, and let's just do a little bit of remote Terra Mystica. Yeah, it's not a bad idea. That one I almost recommend playing in person first, though, because it is, it's rough. It's... It's, there's a lot of options. Trying to learn that one, even from the instructions, is a bit rough. It's one of the games I love, but I hate teaching, so it doesn't come off my shelf often. As for the Board Game Arena one, it is terrible for learning. Like, it's it's the worst. Like, you, you need to have read the rules. You, you won't know what to do. There is what you can click on and what you can't, and, like, everyone's got an individual player board. It's, it's nuts. Like, even having played the game, I found it rough trying to figure out what certain things were or how to do them. I'm like, I know every faction has a faction power. How do I learn what it is? Uh, speaking of the factions, though, this is the cool part, and this goes back to basically the beginning of the conversation where Sean noted that Board Game Arena was so good for trying things out. And that's what this has been a lot of fun for, because there are 14 different factions in Terra Mystica you can play, so 14 fantasy races. And I've gotten to try five brand new ones that I never played in my physical copy, so that's been really cool. It's been a lot of fun to experiment with the game like I probably wouldn't do in person. If I'm going to play at the local game store, I'm probably going to pick a faction I know so I don't feel stupid by playing something new, or I'm going to be playing with someone who's competitive and really wants to play to win, so I want to be a challenge for them. I don't want to be like, I don't know what to do with the Giants. Whereas Board Game Arena, for whatever reason, I'm just like, yeah, whatever. If I screw up the Giants this turn, we'll play next time. Yeah, it's the great thing about BGA is try, try, try. It's it's one of those things where even if you are a competitive person, especially because of the stretched out timeline, it doesn't feel as competitive. So you're more <laughs> likely to, to try those things. And I think as a way, even if it's harder to learn, you know, if we got five games in and I finally picked it mm-hmm. up, yeah, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It helps that the people we're playing with, right? Like we're playing with Eric, his wife and his friend, Steve and Anshi games and Sean, like not like we're all, it's always weird to say it. it feels weird to say we're not competitive. No, we're competitive. Everyone plays to win. No one's throwing games, but we don't care about winning. The, the, it's the experience of playing the game, right? That's what's important to us is playing the game. And yes, we want to win, but if we don't win, so what? We'll win the next game. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 930 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Thanks to our moderator, and she Games. Uh, tonight, we've got a bunch of people in the room. We've got Steve and Brian and uh, Major Kayla is back again. Lots of chat going on. We've got Azul being picked up for Christmas. Uh, nice. We've a lot of chat going on about... Uh, where is this game? Uh, Brian asked about a game... Concept. Yes. Oh, fantastic game. Probably my favorite party game. I love that game. A little hard to describe without the board in front of you, but basically you have a bunch of icons on a board and you draw a card and it gives you something, a concept, like Spider-Man or superheroes or Swiss Family Robinson. And then you have to get the other players to guess that by using the icons. And there's a little bit more to it, but that's basically it. Fantastic game. Uh, And uh, a lot of people agree that it's... uh... Uh, this dice game is better than Courier, uh, Couriers. Oh, Dice Forge? Yes, Dice Forge. Better than Couriers? Yeah, well, cor- eh, it's different Better organized than dice. Couriers. Yeah, okay. Um, to me, they're they're pretty separate, except for both having dice. It's kind of different. Fair enough. Better than Couriers, though, is the Dice Masters. Though you don't want to try to keep, keep up with WizKids' release schedule because it's a collectible game and you buy boosters. Don't even bother. Just buy, like, a couple starter sets and play. It's it's really good. It's a better implementation of Couriers, at least in my opinion. You can find us all across the web now, and we grow by the support of listeners and viewers like you. So please take a minute to subscribe to our content on your favorite platform, and help us spread our gaming advice to the world. We did get an Apple podcast review this week. Thanks, Steve D., for that. Apple reviews help us get out to you and help more people find the show. I'm not a huge Apple fanboy. I do own some of their products. But that is the 
main media that everyone else scrapes to get ratings. So please send out those Apple podcast reviews. Now, if you do do a review, please give us a heads up because we're in Canada. So it's actually really hard to see reviews sometimes if they're from other countries. Yeah, I, I will actually get a notification, but I only get it once a week. So depending on when you drop your notification, it may not get to me for a while. Fair enough. Uh, sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox every Wednesday. We're going to send out an email recapping all the content we've released the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Good job. There we go. Okay, one other thing about our newsletter. Okay, we now have a, a lead magnet or chaser, whatever they're called. I put out something cool today. So if you subscribe to our newsletter, if you go to newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com, Actually, I don't know how it works if you go to the web page. I assume it would still work. It would still be in the email. Um, I made a printable, something cool for Terraforming Mars, something I made, I'd say, by hand. I don't know. When you make something in Photoshop, is that still by hand? Whatever. Sure. It's, it's, it's unique. It was created by me. I didn't just download something off the internet. So I made some cool thing for Terraforming Mars. So if you subscribe to the newsletter, uh, if you were already subscribed, you would have got a link in the newsletter. If you're not already subscribed, you can go and sign up. And when you do and you confirm in your email, you will then get an email back that says, thank you for subscribing with a link to a zip file containing two files for Terraforming Mars. And I see Steve D got his and did say thank you. So looks like people do dig it. Speaking of giving stuff away, uh, now the cat's out of the bag or the arrows out of the quiver, as the case may be. Our next giveaway we are going to be doing is going to be checking out a quiver from Quiver Time. These are high-end carrying cases for card games, and I've got one in this box right here, this big Amazon box. For those of you at home, I'm holding up a big Amazon box. Now, part one is going to be the bellhop opening that box live here on Twitch. That is going to happen tomorrow. That's Thursday, November 15th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. For those listening at home, you should be able to find a highlight of that on our Twitch stream and our YouTube channels. So, yeah, come back tomorrow night. Join us tomorrow night, twitch.tabletopbellhop. <clears throat> Sorry, twitch.tv forward slash tabletopbellhop. I can say it. I just get it in the wrong order. And you can hear my thoughts on this cool-looking product as I open the box and check it out for the first time. Another one, this one, just we just found out today, just got confirmed two weeks from today. So that's Wednesday, November 28th, today being today us li recording live, not you listening at home on your podcaster, catcher, whatever. So Wednesday, November 28th, we're going to have a guest on the show. It's our second guest check-in, our second interview, if you will. I got in contact this morning with Daniel Zayas. I should say he got in contact with me, and he's scheduled to stop in that night. Uh, what I plan to do is instead of doing a special episode, we're just going to invite him for our normal show. So we're going to stick to the usual format, right? We're going to do our what did you play, and we'll find out what he played the next week. We'll do our announcements. We'll do our re-reviews. But when we get to the question and answer period, it's going to be Sean and I asking the questions of Daniel. Now, I don't know if you've heard of Daniel, but he has done a few games um, when Cutie met Patootie at Christmas Lights. But what I'm excited about is a new card game he's got called Mechanisms that's on Kickstarter. Now, this is ironic because you guys were talking about concept in the chat room earlier. Well, this is like concept for gamers, for hardcore gamers and people who have listened to our game design or our game mechanic episode. Basically, you get a bunch of standard game components, get a hand of three cards, then you have to use those components to get the other players to guess the mechanics on the cards. So you're going to be sitting there and going, I don't know, it's worker placement, so I'm going to grab a meeple and I'm going to put it on my hand or something. I don't know, it looks cool. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to Daniel Zayas about it. Yeah, it's, it's not Dr. Zayas, Daniel Zayas. Now, maybe he's a doctor. I'm not sure. That's, that's thanks, Steve, in the chat room for the Planet of the Apes reference. All right, so we're going to look forward to that and uh, getting a third opinion on uh, some of our topics and a, a different point of view in our questions. Yeah, should be interesting. And actually, if let us know some feedback, actually, if you do check out the show, if you've checked out our show with Phil. Like Phil, the Hydro Hacker interview we did as a bonus episode where all we did was talk about Phil, but I found that went rather short. It was shorter than I expected it to. Plus, I 
makes it hard for Sean and I to schedule an extra night to record. So I would rather just stick to our regular schedule. Plus, then we don't have to do any, oh, make sure you turn in this special date. No, just show up here Wednesday, and we'll be here, and we'll do it. So every week, as part of Throwback Thursday, I'm resurrecting an old piece of gaming content, something I wrote years ago on a different platform. Um, on the blog, I'll republish the original article, then add my current thoughts on the topic. Has my opinion changed over the years? So this week, we're heading back to the farm in Agricola. Farming, agriculture in general are just seem to be really big themes in games. The, the number yes. of, of farming games that exist... Uh, both in board game and in video games is kind of staggering. Yeah, it's, 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 I don't know. Maybe it's because it's like a basic engine building, right? Start with nothing and grow. Yep. I don't know what, what the popular, between that and trading in the Mediterranean, I don't know what there's more games on each. Um, so why did I pick Agricola? So I was going back through the Windsor Gaming Resource blog, looking over my old reviews, trying to decide what to bring back, what to resurrect. And I just happened to catch the line at the very top of my Agricola review that said, so how does the current number one game rate? Which obviously I was talking about Board Game Geek. And I thought, well, this would be a good follow-up because last time I talked about Power Grid, which was another game that was way up there on Board Game Geek. And I never did double check to see if it was ever number one, but it was up there. It was top 10. So I thought this was a good follow-up to Agricola. Yeah, and if you're going to review a game, you can do a lot worse than picking the best games in the world to review. <laughs> Fair enough, especially re-review, right? Because that's where you're going to find out, is it still good, right? As opposed to, was, is it, was it good then? So the original review goes into a ton of detail, basically about how to play. As usual, I am not going to re Repeat that here. You can go to the blog and read it. If you don't know Agricola and want to learn all about it, go to tabletopbellhop.com. Click on reviews. Uh, Agricola right now will be at the top. Depending on when you click on this, it should still be near the top. But as a really quick summary, like this is really condensing it down. You're a growing family of farmers. You start off with a simple house and some land. It's worker placement where the workers are those family members. You're originally just a pair, a husband and wife. You assign those workers to various farm actions like collecting resources, sowing fields, building fences, fishing for food, improving your home, raising animals, and, well, growing your family. A classic story of growth in game form. That's true. So at the end of each season, you have to feed your family, and food is not easy to come by in this game. Plus, scoring is really unforgiving. So you get points for pretty much everything, but you lose points if there's any aspect of the game you ignored. So, for example, cows, the more cows you have, basically the more points you get. But if you have no cows, you lose points. Those two aspects of this game have earned it a nickname in the gaming community. And that nickname is Misery Farm. In Agricola, you can never do everything you want, which is true of most good worker placement games. But in this game, you can't even do most of the things you want to do. It's basically all about suffering in one area so you can prosper in another and trying to balance that out better than anyone else. You know, sounds uh, familiar, almost too realistic. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. Now, I did love this game when it came out. Like, it is one of the few times I said the number one spot was deserved. You'll note whenever I'm talking about the number one games on Board Game Geek, it's not often that I'm like, yes, it should be number one. Back then, with the games that were out at the time, I think it deserved number one. Even, I actually liked how unforgiving and tight it was. But that was back in the day. That's true. Because the thing is now, I'll probably never play it again. I'll never touch my copy of Agricola again, and I really should have put it in our Extra Life auction. I'm not sure why I didn't. Because for me, it's been released, replaced. Uh, I see no reason to play it when there's Caverna. So Caverna is a remake and retheme by the exact same designer, Uwe Rosenberg. And I like it more. Uh, for one, it's more forgiving. You don't have to worry about feeding your family. Uh, you're... You can, can't do everything still, but you can do most of the things you want to do. But even more importantly to me, it's flipping dwarves and you're in caves and you're digging mines and clearing the forest outside and you can send your guys on quests and they can level up and your dwarves get better. That's just way cooler than, wow, I didn't get any cows this season, so I can't get any milk, so I can't feed my family, so I have to take out a loan 
Or I'm a flipping dwarf mining and getting resources, and I have a dog that guards my cows. It's just so much cooler. Theme and the game is better balanced, and overall, I think it's better. It's it's all the good of Agricola without any of the misery, without any of the problems, and a much cooler theme. Now, is there a major difference between uh, the original and the revised edition? Do you know what uh, changes were made? So I never bought the revised edition. So Mayfair Games made a mistake, as far as I can tell. Mayfair Games sold the license to Catan to Asmodee. So that was their big game. And when they did that, they somehow had the idea in their head that Agricola was going to replace Catan as their evergreen game. So they rethemed it as Agricola Family Edition, which only plays four players and only includes what was called the Family Edition of the game that did not have cards. So when you play Agricola, there's a card-based system where you get minor improvements and occupations. And everyone gets a hand card and it makes the game asymmetric. And that was one of the big random factors in the game. Well, they pulled that out completely, had just the family game, made it a little more forgiving and made it only four players, and then tried to do what they did with Catan and release a five to six player expansion and release different decks and release, they even released pre-painted miniatures for the new version. And it just, it failed. It's like, I'm sure there's people out there that play it. I'll admit, at this point, I already found Caverna, and I had no interest in retrying Agricola. And simplifying it and making it less player count wasn't anything that was interesting, Inter- that interested me. So, out of the blue, your feed has gone to crap. Um, your audio oh. wanked out there, and your video has uh, gone back to uh, the quality of a couple of mm. weeks ago. So, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Something might have spiked out. Yeah. We will pause for a second. I'm still showing, well, our bitrate dropped, but that's not terrible. That's normal. I'm not seeing a spinning circle. Yeah, it's just, it's this, this, is, it seems like it's a Skype thing, not because it's, it shouldn't, it's not, it, it's, my inbound on Skype is what's, is what's causing the problem. Um, mm. Oh, you're breaking up too, so I don't know. So, yeah. Your audio is fine, but your video is not great. So, something with our Skype connection has gone wonky. No, we, do apologize, anyone watching live. Hopefully, uh, the audio we're recording separate, so the podcast will be good. And it's still better than a couple weeks ago. So I see we just lost a flipping viewer. No, oh, how dare you leave us just because our video went down. No. That was, no, that was Brian. Brian said goodnight to us. Oh, there we go. So it's not so bad. Yeah, I don't know. We'll just keep going. There's not much we can do about it at this point. <laughs> All right. Someone just starts streaming Netflix? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, quite possibly. Not in this household. There's no one to do it. Yeah. Uh, and most of my bandwidth, uh, my, my video services are, are for the family are local, so it shouldn't uh, affect any of that. That <laughs> Emote blame Steve. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. So uh, where were we? So Agricola. Uh, I replaced it with Caverna. And another one that's worth checking out, surprisingly, is Agriculture. Colilla. Wow, I've lost my ability to talk now. Agricola, it's going. It went with the all video. All creatures, big and small. The yes. Two-player. So Agricola, all creatures, big and small. This is a neat two-player version of Agricola. Uh, it's got a lot of the feel of the big box. You're building pens and animals and harvesting, but it's two-player only. It's more of a a quick filler. Like, you can play this in under an hour, and it still kind of gives that feel. I do dig that version. And I've noticed they now put out a big box edition of that, which if anyone knows about that, let me know, because I'm not sure. What, what do you put in a big box? I didn't don't remember expansions coming uh, out. There are Usually two, when you put out a big bo- two previously released expansions are included. Oh, see, I didn't even know there were two expansions. So shows. So all creatures big and small. I obviously don't play that often or pay that much attention uh, to so the news. So uh, it's all creatures big and small, all creatures big and small even more. And all creatures big and small, more buildings big and small. Okay. Eh, it might be worth checking out at some point. I do dig it, but you know what? For two-player games, though, there's Azul and there's Patchwork and there's the Duke and there's lots of other good two-player games, too. So who knows if I'll ever give it back to. But yeah, overall, Agricola, fantastic when it came out. I personally have very little interest in ever playing. Like if someone sat down and was like, oh, it's my favorite game. Will you play? I'll play. But I don't need it. I, it's, it's fine the other way. Each episode, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or you can head over to the webpage, tabletopbellhop.com, and click on Ask the Bellhop. 
Uh, social media works too. We're pretty much everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop what were one word. Well, I prefer questions come through the website because they're a lot easier to track on my end. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere else. This week, patron of the show, Steve D, asks, I have about 150 games, and currently I'm sorting these on my shelves in alphabetical order. This way, I can find a game quickly on the shelves, but when I get a new game, sometimes it takes some work to get it in order. I want to resort my collection, and I'm wondering, how do you sort your games? Thanks. Uh, thanks for the question, and also support of the show, Steve. Uh, this is a good one. Every gamer deals with this as their collection grows, right? Like, I... Uh, Every gamer's collection seems to grow. It seems like a hobby that you don't get into and, you know, go part way. Uh, it seems like anyone who gets into hobby board games tends to dive in uh, often head first. Uh, the biggest problem, of course, with sorting your collection isn't that bad until you run out of space. And then you have to add a new game and there's no holes. That's when it seems to be a problem. Now, there are a lot of aspects you could, we can cover in this beyond just uh, put them in this order. Thanks and good night. <laughs> Yeah, definitely true. We, we could just make this nice and short. Um, one side note, I know Steve is commenting on my pronunciation of Agricola. Yeah, I know. I think it's supposed to be ag Agricola. Agricola, I think, is the proper term. I probably should have been trying to pronounce that right. Not Agricola, because we're not growing Coke. That's probably another theme of a game. Anyway, so Agricola. Sorry, my bad. And I even know that. It just, for some reason, I came out the other way, Agricola. So, yeah. Um, put your games all quick order. Good night. We're not going to do that. But I'm going to first talk about how I organize my games. Uh, it's pretty basic. People have seen the pictures. Uh, I don't have the whole Calax thing, right? The IKEA Calax that every gamer seems to love. I have bookshelves, lots and lots of standard bookshelves, like you can see behind me. Uh, I don't even know how many are in our basement, but it's a lot. Uh, and she games dad used to own an office furniture rental place. So we got a really good price on bookshelves and got a bunch of bookshelves. That's also where my game table came from. Uh, what I do is I organize my games as best I can alphabetically by bookshelf. So one bookshelf will have say A to C instead of going A all the way across and then B whenever that ends. So I go A to a, A to B, A, B, C, maybe on the first shelf. Um, then I do it by box size. Now, box sizes is, is generally I try to do it um, first ergonomically uh, and weight-wise so I'm not bowing the shelves. Now, we do have nice thick one-inch shelves on our bookshelves, which is something I insisted on. But I still I put the biggest box at the bottom, right? So your, your coffin boxes, your Fantasy Flight games came in these, right? Like you have your big... Um, they don't tend to put games in them anymore, but Descent and Twilight Imperium and um, Fancy Flight, like these certain size boxes, those tend to be on the bottom. Uh, my Games Workshop games, you can see back there. Um, those, when I had them stored downstairs, were also on the bottom. They came in these big, long boxes. Um, they're usually on the bottom shelf. And then the next step up, I have... The squarish ones, you know, the standard board game box, you can see a pile of them behind me there. The, they, they tend to be square. They tend to fit great in Calax shelves. Almost every company is using them. Why every company doesn't use them, I don't know. That would be really nice if they did, if they standardized. I can fit two stacks of those on a shelf. And then it leaves room for a couple, like up to three bookshelf style games. So these are your Avalon Hill, right? Most people stand their games up this way and they look like a bookshelf. Um, I put those up there. They, they tend to go on the next shelf. And then the shelves on the top are um, mostly those bookshelf style ones. And then the smaller stuff, I literally just kind of mix in. So they end up going on top of stuff on the edges, wherever they tend to fit. Um, or I have books on my bookshelves as well, right? Where we're into geeky novels, fantasy, sci-fi type stuff. And there's usually room in front of the novels to fit small box games. So we do that. Um, then odd shaped stuff tends to end up on top of the actual bookshelf because there's a little room before the ceiling. So I've got like my huge massive boxes like mechs versus minions gloomhaven that's on top of the bookshelf because it doesn't fit on a shelf also tins i hate tins please don't put out games in tins game designers i get maybe it gets your attention in the game store but they're so terrible this shelf they're terrible hate them um so i do all this where possible it doesn't work perfectly but it works well enough so yes, I have a D game on my A shelf because it fits best there. And I think bottom of the ninth is above my M shelf because I happen to have a spot that that size weird little box fit perfectly, right? So it, it's I try to go alphabetically to a certain point. 
So, in short, you have to be willing to throw out your system to make it work for you. Have a plan, but don't live and die by it. Yeah, very true. Very true. Uh, you, you can't. If if I didn't, I would have so many silly gaps, right? Like if I just went pure alphabetically, it'd be a big waste. Um, so I could end here, right? Like that's what Steve asked. How do you store your games? And I just told them how I stored the games. But that's no fun, right? We're plus we're here to give you advice, and knowing how I put my games isn't necessarily the only way to put your games. So over the years, I've seen lots of ways to organize your games. Many, um, some from going to local gamers' houses, and yes. Though people seem shocked by it, there are a few gamers in Windsor that have collections that dwarf mine, and they store those in very interesting ways. Um, also, I've seen how they organize lot game libraries at a local um, board game cafes and the local game stores that have collections to use. And I've gone to cons, right? Like you go to a big con like Origins, seeing how they store their games, right, and how they organize them. Plus, every podcast, not every it's not a common topic, but a lot of podcasts, this comes up at some point, right? And people have explained it. Usually it's not in this in depth. I think most podcasts I've listened to have done what I just did and said, here's how I store mine. Done, right? We don't do that. We're here to give you more information than that. So I am going to list some of the most popular ways I've seen over the years with pros and cons for each. Now, we need to remember that Mo has a very large collection, and that's, that's why he is the board <laughs> game, <laughs> the, the, the tabletop bellhop. Now, this will color his opinion some. Uh, If you only have a dozen or so games and you're one of those strange hobby board game collectors who hasn't uh, gone mad with power and and (laughs) game collecting, you might not feel some of this pain. Um, So just be aware when we're talking about this, a lot of this goes towards the heavier gamer who deals with a larger collection than your normal family game collection. In general, though, this is going to apply to anyone who runs out of space, right? If you have one bookshelf, how do you arrange the games on multiple shelves, right? If I, I don't know many gamers that don't have at least a couple shelves worth of games. So, yeah, fair enough. I do own a lot of games, and I'm more talking about larger collections, not smaller ones. So the first one, I already talked about this alphabetically, right? Um, this is how I try to organize my collection. Your big question here is you do, you do A and then B, then C, then D across the room. So you're spreading over multiple bookshelves or do you go A, B, C, D or A, B, C, D going down in one area and break it up by bookshelf. Um, some of the things that come up too is like, what do you do with, the uh, the numbers, right? You've got a bunch of 18xx games. Where do they go? If you happen to have something with an ampersand, like, yeah, there's a few things to consider, but mostly it's put the games in alphabetic order. So pros, really simple. It's easy to find games. You know where to look. Even if it's shif- shuffled a bit, you know where to start looking. If I'm looking for Caverna, I'm going to head to the start of my shelves. If I'm looking for Zularetto, I'm going to go to the end of my shelves. Now, cons. Uh, different box sizes, as we mentioned, makes pure alphabetical, I would say impossible, like basically impossible without wasting a ton of space. The hardest part, though, is once you filled your shelves or once even one shelf is full, if your A to B shelf is full and then you go out and you buy that shiny new copy of Battle or Second Edition, wow, wh- what do you do? Like, do you have to now shift every game and every shelf down one so you can fit it in so it goes in the right spot? Or when you're building your collection, do you leave holes here and there just to try to make it so it's easier to rearrange? It, it can be a problem trying to resort, and I think that's where Steve's at. He's at his 150 games, and he's like, wow, alphabetical worked great for a while, but now it's getting a real pain maintaining it. If you are looking to main and manage a alphabetical list, I recommend using a digital list. Uh, sort yourself in Excel or Google Docs, and using their sorting will help you overcome some of the sorting issues like using numbers, ampersands, uh, if you want to, you can type it in as uh, type games that have the as the front. You can type it mm-hmm. in as the name comma the so that it yep. sorts in that manner. And that way your your alphabetical list is easily printable and you can manage it that way and not have to worry about that. And you can tack your list up somewhere on a shelf to in case your mm-hmm. your friends come over and want to see what you've got, <laughs> you know. And then, uh, again, that site you just recently joined, you can export your collection on BoardGameGeek. So if you take the time to actually put down in your collection on BoardGameGeek, you can easily export it, sort it. You can sort it by all kinds of things, which is great for sorting your games on the shelves. So up next is box type. So this is my, like, secondary sort method at home. Um, 
one of the problems is obviously that box sizes are not standardized. It would be fantastic if they were. Uh, but there are some common sizes. Uh, this is part of what makes Calex shelves from IKEA so popular is they are just wide enough to fit that standard sized board game box, right? The, the, the Fantasy Flight, the Stronghold games, um, they all tend to use the same size. Renegade Games uses that size as well. That's why Calex is so popular. And they're usually deep enough that you can even fit in the power grids and the longer boxes. Um, one of the interesting things I've seen with box type is people tend to group them so that all the bigger boxes, like I've seen it with a collection, like say spreads left to right, where the biggest box is on the left and it slowly gets smaller and smaller and smaller as they go to the right. I've also seen it obviously where bigger on the bottom and smaller to the top, which is good because that's more ergonomic. You do not want a heavy game above your shoulders. I worked in the auto industry for years. That is, you want to stay in the golden zone. The midweight stuff should be right in front of you. The heavy stuff should be down and the really light stuff should be above your shoulders. Um, the other thing I always find amusing when I see box type, sorted by box type, is there's always one shelf or one cube. just has all these little card games in it and little tiny boxes, and you can't tell what anything is. I tend to find that one amusing. I mentioned it before, so I tend to put my small stuff on shelves with novels because, no, not all my shelves are games. There is some other stuff under there. So the pros, the, the best part of sorting by box type is you're playing Tetris and you are optimizing your space. You are going to fit more games in your game room, and more games is always a good thing. The cons, of course, are it can be hard to find the games. For one, if you forget what box size a game comes in, where are you going to have to find it? Plus, if someone else comes and you're like, hey, can you just go grab whatever for me off my shelf? They're going to have a hard time unless they know it. If it's your collection, you're probably going to remember where everything is. But if anyone else is using your collection, it's probably not the best way. Now, if you are really tight on space, this can be your best solution because of the Tetris aspect. Uh, yeah. you're, you're, you're maximizing the use of, of space. Uh, and if space is at a shortage, uh, this may be, for better or worse, this may be the solution mm -hmm. that works best for you. Yeah, maybe the only solution. <laughs> so up next, I have, uh, I group these two together, publisher and designer, because basically the pros and cons are the same for both. So this is where you're going to put all your Aaliyah games together, or you have your Games Workshop shelf, or your, in my case, Games Workshop bookcase, or you're going to have all your Stefan Feld together, or show off your Uwe Rosenberg collection. Um, I, I kind of dig this. What I like about it, one of the pros, is that it keeps groups of games you like in one spot. So again, this goes back to my automotive background. You're doing a sort so that the stuff you use the most often, you're going to put in a place that's easy to get to. And the stuff you don't you like or don't use as often is going to be put to the edges. Uh, there's something I like about the curated feel of, of this. Like at this point, it feels like you're curating your collection, kind of like an art gallery, right? You're showing off that, hey, I really dig this designer. Look how many games I have by them. Um, cons. This is great when you have a lot of games by one person or from one publisher, but what about the rest of your games? Like, yeah, here's your Uwe Rosenberg, but what about all your, I only own one game by Eric Lang, and I only own one game by Kevin, and Sean made this card game. Where's that go? Um, plus, I hope it's only going to be you trying to find games, because you're going to remember where stuff is, but again, if you someone else comes in or if you're displaying your collection publicly, they're going to have a real hard time finding it, because it's probably in no order they'll be able to figure out. Yeah, I, I can't imagine going over to your house with this system where I don't yeah. know I don't know board game designers. I know a bunch of different games and, and I'm learning more and more from from watching this show and, and, and being a part of this show. But you know, if you told me to go get the Stefan Feld game, uh yeah, I I'd be looking for a while yeah. before I, it finally shame, uh came up. Now, the number of games you have can really impact this method. Mm -hmm. Uh again, if you've got a large enough collection that you do have a, a number of games from, from different uh, designers or publishers, uh, this becomes a more viable solution. But if mm -hmm. you've got you know one game from 40 different publishers or designers, the, the concept of using this becomes a lot less viable because you're just going to end up doing alphabetic except for this mm -hmm. one designer that you really like. Um, and then do you do alphabetic by game title or by designer? <laughs> like, exactly. And then yep. you have to know the designer of every game. And I'll admit, like, not a lot of people know designers' names, right? Like, that's that's a sign that you're heavier into games when you start knowing that I like games designed by Stefan Feld and Uwe Rosenberg and know who those people are, right? So that's taking it to that next step. So, yeah, if, if, if you don't know them, like, I don't know. It's kind of crazy. 
So up next, this is similar to the last one. So system or mechanics. And I mainly brought this one up because I noted my collection's alphabetical and all that by box size. Well, that's only the board games. The R my RPG collection is sorted completely different. So the way I did my RPG collection is all boxes and books are sorted by RPG system, which to, for RPGs to me makes more sense. So all the Warhammer Fantasy role plays together. That makes sense. But even more so because they're separate, uh, separate games, but the same system as all my White Wolf is together. So I have Vampire next to Werewolf next to Mage, even though alphabetically those would all be very far apart. Well, I guess Vampire and Werewolf might be pretty close, but Mage would be somewhere else. Um, all my Earthon is on one shelf. I just, here's my Earthon shelf. And while I have an entire bookcase of D&D stuff from over the years... And then I subsort those by edition, right? So my D&D shelf has my 5E stuff, then my 4E stuff, then my 3.5 stuff, then a couple shelves of 2E stuff, and then I have all the box sets at the bottom. So you can also do this with board games, but it's a little different, right? Because there aren't as often editions of board games, though it does seem to be happening more often with the second edition. But in that case, you don't usually keep the first edition. But what you can do this with is themes and mechanics, so you could have a social deduction shelf, or you can have all your train games together, or you can come to my house and head over to Worker Placement Corner and grab games from that shelf. So what's cool about this, especially in the RPG section, is it keeps everything you need for one game in one place. So when you're going to DM, you don't have to look all over to find your books in alphabetic order. They're by edition. I think that makes the most sense. Um, also... It's kind of cool for board games because it filters your collection. So when someone comes over and you go, what kind of games do you like? And they go, I like co-ops. You can head to the co-op area and you don't have to look at the whole room, right? You can focus on that one set of games. Or you, I really like worker placement games, right? I do dig the idea of this. I just don't know how practical it is. So it has the same problems as grouping by designer publisher, right? You have to remember where the game is, what, it, what I sort that under, and what do you do with all the leftovers, right? If you don't own a whole bunch of social deduction games, where do you put those in relation to the others? And then how do you sort each group, right? Like I have my worker placement games. Does worker placement go under W so I sort them alphabetically or not? Well, and also, what about those more complex games? You know, where do you put the games like, uh, you know, Gloomhaven even, yeah. uh, where, you, where you've got so many different mechanics built into these games? If you like heavy games, this is definitely not the system that you're going to want to go with because there's so much overlap. You're going to be doing <laughs> Venn diagrams to in, in order to build your, your shelving system. Um, yeah, I, I got to put the worker placement near the deck builder so I can put the games that are both in the middle. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, this gets really complex really fast uh, for, for simpler systems or if you like the simpler, more basic uh, games, this might be a good solution for you. But the, the more advanced you get, the more you're going to hurt trying this. Yeah, fair. So up next, player count. Um, this is one of my favorites. Geektropolis Cafe did this. Uh, Big J Russell. This is great for a gaming cafe. I personally think this is a brilliant way to organize your games. It's also great for if you're running a game convention or other public area or if you have a store with demo copies. Because the first starting point you go to play any game is you look at how many people you have. It's the first questions that's at. Okay, how many people do we have? We have six players. Okay, do you have any games to play six players? And then I got to think, do I have any six player games? And my sections alphabetically and I start looking at A and it would be so much nicer to just go, let's go to the six player shelf and take a look. Now, of course, the problem is games can be played by a number of players. So again, Big J was kind of brilliant on this. So we talked about it in our special Board Game Geek episode, which you may or may not have heard at this point. But one of the best things on Board Game Geek is the fact you can go and look at the recommended player count, which is determined by um, actual gamers, right? Your peers, people who play games, put these ratings in. It's not by the designers and it's not by the publishers. Though I'm sure maybe their voices are in there. But it's usually a really good consensus and very very significantly useful information. That was a weird way to word that. Anyway, um, so what he did is he went on Board Game Geek and he looked at the recommended player count and he went with the highest. So if it was recommended two, three, or four, he put it under four. But for more sport, a lot of games on Board Game Geek, there's only one number there, so it's nice and simple. I 
dig this. Like, it worked great at Geektropolis. Like, we walked over and literally you go, oh, there's four of you. Hey, welcome. You want to play a game? You want to start here. And then what he did, which is even cooler, is he then sorted it by types. So he had his player games were always on the, or his, his light games. He did kind of wait. I don't know. It was based on the type of customers he was getting, right? So if it was like families and kids, those games were at the top and all the heavy war games were at the bottom. But just i really dig that player count thing so the pro obviously is deciding what the play is easier um it filters your list again you're looking at a subsection of your games if you only have five of you you only have to look at the five player section or back right um it's also really good when other people are coming to your house right if i'm like sean we got three people go downstairs and pick something from the three player shelves um it's also really good for people who don't know player counts on games right so not everyone knows that uh, Catan doesn't play two player there's an example because i've had many people tell me oh i tried Catan; it was terrible me and my wife played and i'm like whoa you play Catan two player no no it's three player or bet more please right so it's great for that because people don't realize what games fit into their count uh the cons of course are kind of what i mentioned deciding where to put a game can be hard and many games are good at multiple player counts and Again, it gets hard to sort because of the box size problem. And I've noticed box sizes tend to vary based on player count, right? Like you get to that for one thing in that four to five player count, it's every box size imaginable. And then two players, it's both. It's like quick card games and small boxes to giant war games. And it's one or the other. There don't seem to be a lot of mid-sized two-player games. So sorting gets difficult with the box size thing. So for me on this particular thing, I think this is actually a great accessory uh, method. So I wouldn't choose to view this unless, you know, the game works well for, for Geek Chocolates and for a gaming store or a gaming uh, uh, cafe. But in a home collection, I would love to see this done as a sticky note on, on your box. So mm-hmm. you can look at your collection, however you've got it stored in your preferred way, and either a color code or a number or a, of some sort of, a, you know, easily seen identifiable uh, sticky right there on the box can separate it furthermore on as well as whatever your normal sorting method is into player counts. So, Hey, go downstairs, find something three player. That's the orange stickies on, uh, mm-hmm. on the shelves. Uh, could be a really good way to work with that and avoid some of the box problems that, uh, sorting it purely by this method would run mm-hmm. into. Cool. That's kind of ironic. In my next section, I'm going to bring up stickies for a different purpose. <laughs> So the next one is by play status. Now, I don't know anyone that's done this. I don't know if anyone actually has done it. I've only heard people mention it on podcasts. I do kind of dig it. So what this is is sorting games based on when they were last played. So basically, you have one area for games to be played. So your pile of shame, shelf of shame, whatever you want to call it. Then you have the games you just played in the past month and the month previous. It doesn't have to be a month. could be a week. And when you play a new game, it goes to the top of the list, right? It goes on the hotness shelf or the I just played this shelf. It's hot. We're playing it right now. Um, as you play games, basically, they move up the shelves or on, on the shelves. Now... I can't see how this is practical, but I did hear about someone who did something similar, who had their collection sorted a different way and used post-its, like Sean just noted. But instead of player count, they had color-coded them. So in December, they used blue post-its, and if they played a game in December, they put a blue post-it note on the games they played. And then then when they go into... um, the next month, January, they had a different colored post-it note, and they would pull off the old one and put... Excuse me, pull off the old one and put down a new one when they swapped up when they played the game. And then over time, eventually every game got a post-it note on it, or it didn't. Um, Which is what's really cool, because you can organize them however you want this way, and then stand back and look at the colors. And what I dig about this is it's a great way to curate your collection. Not in the art gallery way of, hey, look at what I've got, but in the, hey, we haven't touched this. Like, this has sat here for five months, and I haven't played it or longer, and maybe that's a good indicator to get rid of it, or even more so, maybe that's a 
hey, we haven't played this in a while. Let's get it to the table and let's see if it's still fun. Like, let's see if we still dig this game. So I like it because it's a reminder of how long your games are in your collection sitting unplayed. So it gives you a value. Um, as we talk about the games that are you are playing, as I've mentioned many times, the game you're playing right now is the best game in your collection. And anything that just sits on your shelf gathering dust is not a great game, even if you spent a fortune on it and it has the best miniatures. If you're not playing it, it's not worth it. It's you might be better off getting rid of it. And this system makes that visual. It makes it obvious. It's, again, going back to automotive, it's the warehouse management. It's the very easy, you walk into your game room, you can instantly see the status of your game collection. Of course, the con is, especially if you don't use Post-its, this is way too much work. Like, this, I think, would be impossible. That every time I play a game, I have to put it on a new shelf and shift everything else down. Like, that sounds like something that I would never want to do. That's just constant rearranging and reshelving. So I can see this with a collection where you need a lot of turnover. Uh, if you're a reviewer uh, or a podcaster who does, you know, reviews or, or does a lot of... Uh, you know, that sort of material needs to get through a lot of board games and particularly new board games and may not have enough time, a lot of time to go back and play the old stuff. Mm -hmm. This is great because you've got your pile in front of you and it's, you know, last in, first off, um, and you're cycling through that pile and putting the rest onto a shelf. You may even have, mm -hmm. you know, different shelves of, hey, I want to keep this. Hey, this is going to go get donated next year, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're cycling through games a lot, um, and you aren't doing a lot, a lot of replaying, and you aren't doing a lot of local group playing necessarily, or or different groups. This could be a great solution. Uh, but again, for for the normal board gamer, this probably isn't the best way to go. No, I do like some aspects of it, but I don't think it's practical. Practical. So a couple people in the chat are upset that I'm saying if you don't play a game, get rid of it. Uh, in my opinion, you know what? I used to be a collector until I ran out of room. Once I ran out of room, and the fact I'm still getting new stuff. What's the point in keeping the game when you can give it to someone else who will probably enjoy it more than you? Plus, you can probably sell it and either donate that money to charity, Extra Life, or even better, sell it. To, well, not better, but <laughs> more selfish. You sell it, you get the money, you use that money to buy the new game that gets played, right? I, I don't think there's anything wrong with actually filtering your collection. Um, it did take me a while to get to that point. And, um, and, and, we're and not I'm not saying get rid of it if you're... We're talking about multiple rooms it took him to get through before he yes. got to that point. This is not That's we true. filled the bookshelf and we need to we need to start playing. No, 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 no. There are rooms, there are stacks of board games you can see in the background there yeah. that, that it took to get to the point of getting of, of understanding that it's okay to get rid of a board game once in yeah. a while. Now, again, if you're going to play it eventually, don't get rid of it, right? It's the fact that sorting this way makes you think about it, right? The fact that you go, wow, it's been a long time since I played that. If you look at it and your thought is, I need to play it again because it's been a long time, you keep the game. But if your thought is, wow, I haven't played that in a long time and I have no interest in ever playing it again, why keep it? Unless you're just a collector and you're trying to show off your collection, that's when you hit that point where you're like, okay, yeah, everyone's seen my game room. They know it's impressive. I don't need to impress anyone anymore. For a while, it was a matter of pride for me. I was a collector. I still collect stuff. Now and then. There's a reason I don't tend to buy uh, collectible card games. I can get sucked into that. But yes, uh, RPGs for me are a very different story because in my opinion, every RPG I own, I may play at some point. I don't own any RPGs that I am not interested in playing at some time. RPGs, it's so hard to find a group, especially games that require campaign play, that yes, they could sit on my shelves forever. Maybe when I retire, I'll play through all of them. I don't know. We'll see. But Board games in particular, I don't think have that staying power. Some games, like I mentioned earlier in the show, Agricola was replaced by Caverna. I, I still have Agricola. I said silly. I should have, I should have put it in the extra life auction. There is no reason for me to keep that game. Uh, where were we? Okay, popularity. This one I also dig. I, I like this a, a lot actually. So I first heard this on a podcast where the person who runs the show has a game room. And that's a different room than they store their games. See, for me, I just think game room surrounded by shelves with games around it. And when you watch people stream online, that seems to be a pretty common thing to have your game table in the same room you store your games. Well, that wasn't the case for this podcaster. I'm sorry, I don't remember who it was. So what they did is they bought one of the short Calac shells from Ikea, 
we should be getting paid by IKEA for this episode. Um, and they put it in the game room, and all the rest of the games are in their game storage area, right? Like basically a game archive. And then what they put in the game room on those shelves were the games they're excited to play about, right? The stuff they're currently passionate about, what's currently popular at their house, right? Their hotness. And then when people came over, they'd be like, hey, here's my hot games. Pick one of these and we'll play it. So... And then after the game night, like every so often, they would swap it up, right? Like new games would go on the new shelf and they get put to the archive or other times they go to the archive and swap the games up. Now, you could do this with a full collection, even with what I have, right? Uh, I could take one bookshelf and say, this is my hotness. I, I do dig this. Like if I had two rooms, I would totally do this. Well, technically I have two rooms, but we don't game up here. It's all my miniature stuff's up here because someday I may paint again. You'll notice that's the theme behind you. All those games have miniatures in them. Um, but like I could do it with my thing downstairs. It's 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 a kind of cool idea. Like maybe even in our video game area, we have a bookshelf full of uh, DVDs and stuff. Maybe put some hot games on there. I do dig it. Um, the pros, obviously, it's the same thing. It's going to filter your game collection to something manageable. So it's going to make selection quicker, right? Like, here's the games I'm excited about. Don't look at the rest of my collection. Don't even worry about those. This is what I want to play. Of these, what are we putting on the table? Uh, the con, of course, is that you're going to be rotating stuff, right? Especially for me. I told you my, my top 20 list is my top 20 list right now. What I consider hot changes a lot. And I have a feeling if I did do this, I'd be spending a lot of time swapping out games. Like, oh, it's game night tonight. Oh, wait, I don't want that there. And I don't want this here. And I'd be swapping. I mean, it could be labor intensive. Now, see, this is the one I think you should be using. Uh, this is actually the way I think you should go. And, and, and I think and it, it's nothing to do with the two room. I, 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 I get the two room thing. That actually is a great idea. Mm -hmm. But a lot of what you focus on is both hotness and shame. Um, mm -hmm. You need to get through shame piles and you, need, and, and you love playing your hotness piles. And if you could, you know, separate out these uh, some of the shelves downstairs so that you had, you know, this is the shame pile. If, we, if we're going to do something new tonight... Let's look at the sh at the shame shelf, and no, no, we want we want something comfortable. Let's let's hop into the hotness, and you still got all the other games there. It's not like they mm -hmm. aren't there. So especially like for New Year's when people show up, and and you know you want to dig out something, there you go. You could easily, I mean, you could easily bury some stuff that was not getting paid down further, and if it doesn't come out in a year, it goes to extra life. Um, yeah, but that you know that stuff that you're playing, the Azuls, the you know, the Gloomhaven, if you ever box it up and want to hurt your back, you know, whatever, whatever is, ha is, is happening right now is there. And also those shame games that you know you need to get to, but sometimes end up on a pile on a chair somewhere else. So out of sight, out of mind, and you're not maybe playing those as well. Yeah, I, like I do this to a small amount. Like you're not over for my regular game nights, right? So what I do on my regular game nights is before people show up, I make a small pile. So I make a hotness. This is what I want to play tonight. So we had a game night Monday. You'll hear about all these games next week. Well, not all of them because we didn't play all of them. So I grabbed the networks and I put it out. And then I grabbed Brass Birmingham and I put that out. I had grabbed a game called Cypher off the pile of shame. And there was something else. I can't remember what the last one was. But I had a pile of four games. And I'm like, when people showed up, I'm like, all right, here's the four games. What are we playing? So it's, it's a smaller version of that. And then after they went home, I put them back on the shelf. And I do do that. Same thing when I go to the game store, right? When I go to the game store, I use milk crates and I fill a milk crate. And I'll bring four to eight games. And that's what I'm excited about, right? Is here's what I want to play. So it, it's a little bit like that. But I do kind of dig it. But again, I'd hate to, for me, the amount of games I have, it would take me so long to empty out a shelf to then move everything, then put stuff on. Like it's the constant shifting around. Even better, like you mentioned earlier, maybe a spreadsheet, right? Like I should have like something, open it up. Here's my hotness right now. Pick a game from this list. That's something else. There's a completely different topic we should probably cover at some point is how to pick what to play. Like that's something I'm surprised no one's asked us yet. I'll, that's definitely something to go on for. I, 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 I do love this system though. And I think really to, to kickstart you, if you could find one empty shelf somewhere, or make one empty shelf somewhere. <laughs> you could you could kick it into in, into starting that your hard part of the on this because of the the sheer size of your collection <clears throat> is where to start. Um, I would I would tend to say if you found a bookcase somewhere else where you could <laughs> bury where you could bury the the stuff that wasn't being used all the time and and pull that out the you know this stuff like Agricola, um, mm. and 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 get those away. 
uh, and and that you could and then you would be able to free up the space to to start that shame and hotness. Yeah, it's not a bad idea. I actually admit, again, going back to the automotive background, there's a whole system called 5S. Sort, set, shine, standardize, sustain. I, as you can tell, I spent 20 years doing this stuff. I almost used another word for that. Um, which is all about the first step to organization is technically sort, where you take everything you own and you decide one of three things. It's either you use it all the time, you almost never use it. Oh, sorry, it's four places. So you use it all the time, you use it now and then, you almost never use it or you have no idea why you still own it, right? Like you don't use it. And the stuff that's in the bottom pile you get rid of. Like that is a definite step of 5S is anything in that fourth pile actually gets put in an area of your warehouse where other people can then go and go, oh, wait, do I use it? Because you don't want to throw something out that someone else might need. And then the other stuff you then organize by your workspace. So in that case, the games you play the most often would be at the middle of my shelves in the easiest to reach place. Then the games that I play every now and then would spread out from there and the games I almost never play would be on the periphery. So if you were going to properly 5S a game collection, that would be the way to do it, where you would go through first and tag everything. Green games are going to stay, yellow games need to move out, red games go here, and black games get removed, right? Like, it, it is a full system. And I um, I consider going into all of that. Like, I, I still think I could write a lean for board gaming at some point book based on automotive and 5S. So yeah, I did it, I did consider going hardcore into the sorting with that, but then I'm trying to tell gamers to get rid of their games, which you can tell people are already upset. <laughs> I even <laughs> mentioned the suggestion you should call your system, your your collection. <laughs> So at this point, we're going to get to something. I find this one silly, but you know what? It's the way I started, and it's the way my kids organize their games. Uh, you have a board game. You get it. You put it on your shelf or your closet or wherever you put it. Then you get a new game, and you put it next to the other one. And then when you get another new game, you put it next to the other one. And over time, you end up with the games basically in the order you bought them. Um, so you're getting it chronologically, right? Um, the thing is, this usually gets messed up quickly because as soon as you play the game, you tend to just put it back in the last spot or on top of the pile. Um, the one that I have seen that's more organized, just trying to think of a different word instead of what I was thinking. Um, a different way to do it is I have seen people release, put in their games chronologically in the order they bought them. And I've also seen them do it by release date so that they keep the chronology. So when you play a game, you make sure you put it back in the same spot. So this is kind of neat because you're going to, you could see like, wow, I bought that a long time ago or I bought this new. So you can kind of see where your stuff is. Um, the pros, obviously when you're first starting is there's no thinking, you just put the game down in the next open spot, right? You got a spot on the shelf, you put it there, but then what do you do when you run out of space? Do you put the games back where they came from? Once you get to lots of games, you're going to remember, did I buy that in January or February to know where I start? Like it's, it's to me, not a real practical way to do it, but you know what? It's kind of how we all start. It's you get a game and you put it on the shelf and the next game goes on next to it. it this is impractical for a collection that, that's really going to grow into that, that full on hobbyist collection. But uh, for casual gamers and kids, this is probably how most of you are doing it. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just mm -hmm. fine. So just a few others that I'm not going to get into detail about just because those are the main ones I've seen, the ones that seem to actually work. Like I said, chron chronologically, I'm just mentioning, because like I said, oh, that's, my kid's bookshelf is like that. It's grown upwards. So their older games on the bottom shelf and the newer games on the top, just because that's how they filled in the shelf. Um, so other ones I've seen, Board Game Geek rating. Uh, this one's cool. Like, uh, just as good as popularity or hotness. The problem with this one, though, is when the ratings change, what do you do? Like, board game geek ratings are constantly in flux, especially with a new hot game. Are you going to put it at the back of your souls and keep moving it up every week as it gets more popular? It's, it's a neat idea. Uh, next, color. I have seen this done. It looks amazing. Like, if you want, if you're a collector and you want people walking in your game room and go, wow, sort by color. But then you got to remember what color box it came in, and then you've got all the problems of publisher and theme and different size boxes and trying to actually keep things in color order. But man, it could look really pretty. I've seen some awesome ideas. As far as I can tell, people just do that to get some likes on Pinterest. Um, game time. I dig this. I like this a lot. I like this almost as much as player count. This is how long the game takes to play. So also similar. So instead of, okay, the, usually the first question you ask when you're sitting down to play games is how many people do we have? The next question is often how much time do we have? So sorting your games by game time, I like this idea. The problem is game time is so dependent on number of players, the players you're playing with, the familiarity of the game. It's 
like where do you put it? Like if this game takes three hours per player, or, or sorry, three hours per player. My God, I don't want to play that game. If it plays half an hour per player, do you put it at half an hour? Because you usually play with two players. Like it's just like, like I guess if you have the same group, if you always have four players at your house and you know that you can usually finish games within 15% of the game time on the box, or again, Board Game Geek's game time way better, then maybe you can do this. But if you play with a bunch of different groups of people, I don't think it's possible. And then the last one is uh, that I have is weight. So the obviously the Board Game Geek rating, weight rating, which is a one to five scale, you put your heavy games in one spot and you put your light games on the other. And depending on who's over, when your grandmother's over, you play the light games. And when your heavy gamer friends are over, you play the heavy games. Of course, then there's also heavy games speaking Gloomhaven and 32 pound games. As I mentioned, don't be dumb like me and put Gloomhaven on a top shelf. I am trying to work out, lose some weight. Maybe that's why I put it up there. Actually, to be honest, it doesn't fit on any of my shelves. But yes, keep the heavy games low. We talked about it earlier. Um, you want games that are average weight at your shoulders, like that are somewhat heavy, nothing above your shoulders. It's really heavy. Bend it. Don't bend, uh, bend at the knees. Don't bend your back. You know, all that stuff. So uh, Steve has a follow-up in our chat room. He resorted. He resorted his collection by categories. So he has kids games, family games, solo games, two-player games, dungeon crawls, heavier strategy games, and party games, and he's labeled his shelves. It's working there great so, so far for him. Basically the sort by theme we talked about, the, the sort by mechanic in a way. It's a good way to do it. Um, what I wonder is if he then further divides them up, because I still think if you use something like that, then do you do alphabetical? Once you're in the kids' game, are they in order alphabetical? I think it'd be cool to have this then by um, player count. I, it seems to be working. That's great. We'll see if it still works when you're up to 500 games or so, and we'll <laughs> see if it's the same then. Uh, so do you have a selection that we missed uh, or a way of uh, sorting things that you think we should talk about? Mm -hmm. Give us a shout. We'd love to hear, and maybe we'll feature your ideas in a follow-up on this topic. Yeah, as usual, we do read off our listener feedback. So if you have something, we will let people know. Uh, the biggest thing here is that there is no best answer. There, there's no one right way to sort your games. Uh, what most people do is combine some of the above mentioned, or some of the above suggestions. So as I mentioned when I started, I basically do alphabetical by box type, but box type is more and more important now that I've run out of room. I need space. So box type beats out alphabetical as a rule. Like I'm going to try to stay alphabetical, but I'm going to group similar boxes while doing so. So Steve only has 150 games and is going to keep that limit as a upper limit. Nice. Uh, and she games mentions that Steve is sane, having a <laughs> limit of 150 games. <laughs> and uh, yeah. so he doesn't need to subsort uh, because there just aren't enough games once you break it down into that, uh, that category. Fair enough. Like, like the first person I heard who does that was Tom Vassell, right? The guy who reviews more board games than anyone else in the world only ever keeps 100 games in his permanent collection. And if a new game comes in, and he likes it enough, he has to get rid of something. And that's a big factor for how he reviews games, is, is this worth me getting rid of something else? Which really leads to a hard decision. Totally fair. I get it. I don't think I could go down to 150 games. I will admit I am now well under 1,000. I have cut back. I have purged quite a bit. Um, at one time, I did own over 1,000 games. I am no longer at that level. I have been smarter about purging games that I no longer play anymore. And Extra Life thanks you for that. Yes. <laughs> now, I, I forget at, how at many I donated point, this year. At a certain point, space is vital. Um, it's knowing where to start in your game room uh, for anyone, you know, over a, a small single shelf of games. It's daunting. It's uh, You mm. need to sit down and you need to think about what you want uh, and, and thinking about how, how your many you're going to get and how large you, you're willing to let it grow is something you, what you should probably start thinking about early. Uh, rather than uh, mm -hmm. after you've got your 500th game. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, it's a pain. Like, I, I do redo my collection every year for the New Year's party. So I have, a, I have a gaming in the New Year's party where I invite a bunch of local gamers over on New Year's Eve. Sean usually comes down. It's usually a fantastic time. And that is my big cleanup, right? Like, my spring cleaning for my game room is right around New Year's. I, that's when I rearrange everything. So that's where I do the work. So the important thing 
to me, it goes to the whole bellhops law, right? You want to be able to quickly get games to the table and get playing. You don't want to waste time looking for games, trying to find stuff, or having to rearrange things to get one game. You don't want to have to unstack 20 games to get to the one at the bottom because you're going to look at that and go, I don't want to unstack that. Let's just play the one on the top, right? It, you've got to try to organize it so that you can get the stuff to the table quickly. Now, don't worry about putting things away. I don't worry about that at all because to me, that's a lonely fun, right? After everyone's gone home, I've said it many times. Don't, don't like if your friends want to help you pack your games, that's great. Accept the help. But really, you can do that when they leave. Like, I'd much rather say, let's just toss this game aside and start something new and get another game going. That way, fitting more games in your game night. Uh, you can do that later. Um, now, again, the best games in your collections are the ones that hit the table. And where you put your games on your shelves will affect this. And it is something to consider. So even if you put it off till people go home, get, go home though, you, still ha- you do still have to put yeah. your games away. So well, make sure when you're planning this that you don't sa- choose a system that looks and sounds cool, but you don't want to keep up with it. Because, again, yeah. especially if you guys are going to play a bunch of games and your friends are all going to leave and you're going to clean up afterwards because you don't mind doing that. Make sure you don't mind continuing with your system when you're putting those all away afterwards. Yeah, a lot of the systems we mentioned above require maintenance, right? They don't keep themselves. That's one thing about alphabetical. Until you buy a new game, it's fine. But all those other ones, like popularity, board game geek rating, weight, like all, oh, weight may or may not change. You may want to rearrange them. So uh, you got to maintain it, especially if you're doing something like the hotness, right? You need to keep rotating things. So we're going to finish off with some tips because one of the things about organizing your games is it's a lot easier when your games take a lot less space. So this is basically just us promoting ourselves or me promoting our stuff, however you want to word it. Um, I want to talk about inserts and storage solutions. So if you go back to episode four of our podcast, I'm assuming some of you listen now have not gone through our backlog. And that's cool because we were a little rough for the first few episodes. But there is a lot of good information there. And I particularly recommend episode four, insert tab A. In that, I answer a question, are box inserts worth it? And at the time, my conclusion was... If you are saving space, it's good. That's not the only reason. Actually, the main reason box inserts are good is if it gets the game to the table more often, it's worth it, going back to the old bellhop's law. But the other big thing box inserts do is saving space. It condenses down your boxes, expansions fitting in the core box, etc. This is huge for me. Like The biggest example I have is Battlestar Galactica from Fantasy Flight Games. There is the core box, and there are three expansions, and they're those big square boxes. I was able to fit the core game and all three expansions in the base rulebook box with the broken token insert. Shout out to broken token. That is now taking up 25% of the space it used to. That means I can fit three more of that size box or even more smaller ones. So I really dig box inserts for doing it. The one I keep hearing about over and over on social media right now is look for folded space. They do foam inserts and I guess are about 10% of the cost of the wood just as easy or even easier to put together and just as effective. Haven't tried them myself, but you want to condense things down. The other thing I have is a gamer gift guide on game storage. You can check that out over on the blog if you go to search and search gamer gift guide. Coming closer to Christmas, there will be a link somewhere on the homepage to the gift guides. I just realized that's not there yet. So you do have to search to find the gamer gift guides. You can find them all over my social media. But again, you're trying to condense down your collection to fit more games in less space now the other thing it's kind of crazy i don't i can't do it i'm too much of a collector but there are a ton of games that have really big boxes for very small components and i know people who have taken splendor and thrown out the box and have it in a ziploc bag and it takes up like i don't know maybe a a baseball size like a softball size amount of space instead of a box on your shelf uh there is a company that kickstarted these cardboard boxes which are all about tossing out all of your components and putting them all into these little cardboard boxes instead and then just writing with a sharpie on the side i couldn't do it i'm still too much of a collector to do it but man if you want space um you can throw stuff uh, rpgs sell all your books get pdfs now you got tons of room on your shelves right there are other ways to condense your collection um tossing out boxes is a big one i can't do it i i do get rid of expansion boxes it took a long time for anchi games to convince me to get rid of my expansion boxes they were just starting to pile up in my uh, laundry room um now i have a friend that collects them and uses them for an art project so at least they're getting some use 
but yes, uh, try to condense down your collection, it, though you'll have less to sort. Well, this was a great talk, but if you'd like to read more on the topic, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you see this and other questions answered in blog form. Be sure to send your questions to us over on the website under Ask the Bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Uh, just a note, Patreon patrons at the good tip or better level get their questions bumped to the top of the list. The reason we are talking about this topic today is because Steve D in our chat is a patron and asked this question. So we got to his question first. Small perk. Speaking of our Patreon, a shout out and a thank you to our backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Uh, the Misdirected Mark guys, they are back. Welcome back, Misdirected Mark. They're back from Metatopia and all the cons they went to. You can, again, watch them live Tuesday nights right here on Twitch at 8.45 Eastern. Brian Kurtz, who was in earlier but had to take off, thank you very much. Uh, Duran Barnett, who I learned is actually from South Africa the other day, as he was complaining about shipping to South Africa for board games. So Duran, thank you for choosing to spend some of that money on us instead of international shipping. Joe Swick, it's appreciated very much. Uh, Steve D, again, thanks for asking the question. The only reason we talked about sorting today is because Steve asked this question and supports the bellhop. Yeah. Better late than never. Welcome to our latest patron and local <laughs> Windsor, Windsor indie game guru, Jeff Suzu. Su, Su, uh, I probably pronounced that wrong. <laughs> He's in the chat. He could probably correct you. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. Thanks, you know, Jeff. I meant to actually text you this week and ask how to pronounce your name, and I just, when seeing it in the chat, Suze? remember. Suz? 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 Come on. Help us out here, Jeff. We're flailing. <laughs> He's probably lagging a bit. Jeff of the Red Beard. DCC GM extraordinaire. There we go. I see Jeff. <laughs> We're waiting. Yeah. We can wait. We got yeah. time. It's all good. He's like, I don't know how to spell it without spelling it. <laughs> That's why I hate it. How do you pronounce Tuzano? And I'm like, um, I could tell you, but typing it is hard. Now I just put like my parents' license plate. There you go. Two S I N O. Like Dr. Like Seuss. Dr. Seuss. Oh, there we go. There okay, go. so Jeff Seuss, Jeff Seuss, thank you very much. I feel bad for not knowing that. I've known Jeff for not a ton of time, but a number of years over the years. Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas, we're, we're going to talk to in two weeks. D. Zayas, not Dr. Zayas. <laughs> well, thank you, Jeff. Either way, now, now we know how to pronounce your name. I feel bad we didn't find that out ahead of time. Oh, there it was, the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Live to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. We'll invite you in to hang around with us and join us in the penthouse suite for an off-the-books after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.